The Burning Boats, 1861 to 1865, Part 2, with author Timothy R. Snyder. We learn that upwards of 100 boats lying at Williamsport and other points below and above, which have been prevented from passing down with their freight by the rebel troops at Harper's Ferry, Consequently, all business upon the canal has been suspended, and thousands directly and indirectly interested in its trade and commerce thrown out of employment. The Herald Torchlight, June 5, 1861. In late May 1861, uh, Thomas Jonathan Jackson was replaced in Commander Harper's Ferry by Joseph E. Johnston. The Confederates probably wanted a calmer head, an older man, a wiser man. Jackson had engaged in a bunch of provocative acts at a time when uh, the Confederates were trying to woo Maryland to their cause. Well, ironically, uh, just as, as uh, Johnson took command, uh, just a week earlier or so, the Maryland General Assembly adjourned. They took no, no steps towards the session. And then uh, Union troops invaded Northern Virginia opposite Washington, D.C. on May 28th, occupying Alexander, Arlington, the high ground opposite Washington, D.C. As a result, Johnson then would have a free reign. This was evident that a shooting war was on. Maryland was taking no immediate steps towards secession. So Johnson then would uh, take steps to uh, destroy both the Beano Railroad and the Sino Canal prior to evacuating Harper's Ferry. Uh, his troops tapped the canal opposite Harper's Ferry and burned over 25 canal boats, damaged a couple of locks. He also sent parties out to attempt to breach Dan numbers four and five near Williamsport. They were unsuccessful, but these were the first attempts to attack those dams. The information reached here that an attempt was made by the Virginia rebels on Saturday, June 9th, and Sunday, June 10th, night's last, to destroy dams number 4 and 5 on the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal. At number 5, they were met by the brave guards of Clear Spring, who, after considerable skirmishing, succeeded in repulsing them, killing one of their men. The rebels endeavored to blow up the dam by means of a blast, for which purpose they had procured four kegs of powder, but were driven off before they were able to injure it. At dam number four, some damage was done to the canal, but we learned none of the dam itself. It is clearly the duty of every loyal citizen in the county to rally to the defense and protection of the property of the canal company. Herald of Freedom and Torchlight, June 12, 1861. During that attack on the dams, Redmond Burke, an Irishman who later became a bushwhacker and courier for Confederate General Jeb Stuart and was killed in 1862 by federal troops in Shepherdstown, he was every night using a dark lantern visiting dam number four with two of his sons and they worked at drilling for dynamite holes in the rock bed beneath the dam. A dam he once built with others. Philadelphia Public Ledger, June 14, 1861. Most people are more aware of uh, Jackson's later attempts to disable the dams in December of 1861. Um, After the Confederates evacuated, canal traffic was resumed in in late August of 1861. They did try to harass canal traffic. In fact, Turner Ashby, the Confederate cavalryman, wrote to Richmond offering to lead an expedition to break the canal. And a staff officer in Richmond wrote that it was a cherished object of the Confederate government uh, for the Vino Railroad and the Sino Canal both to have been severed or disabled. Monday through Wednesday, September 9th through 11th, 1861, Shepherdstown, Bridgeport, lock number 38. Confederate cavalryman Harry Gilmore wrote, While in camp near Morgan Spring, parties of which I was generally one, would be sent frequently to the Potomac for the purpose of blockading the canal on the Maryland side, by which immense supplies of coal and provisions were brought to the capital. We would go down before daylight, conceal ourselves behind rocks or trees, or in some small building, and when the sun was up, not a soldier or boat could pass without our taking a crack at them, and generally with effect, for we were all good shots. We became a perfect pest to them, and many an effort was made in vain to dislodge us, but we could not be found, for every day we were in a new spot miles apart. Friday through Sunday, September 13th through 15th, 1861, Shepherdstown, Virginia. A brisk skirmish. We learned that a spirited skirmish took place on Friday last, September 13th, between the rebels at Shepherdstown 
and the federal troops stationed opposite the town on the Maryland side. The troops fired at each other across the river, first with small arms and then with cannon. When the rebels commenced firing with a cannon, our troops procured two old six-pounders from Sharpsburg and planted them on the borders of the river and returned the fire with vigor, sending balls and other missiles into the town, which soon put the enemy to flight and terminated the engagement. On our side, a tow boy on the canal was killed but none of the troops were hurt. On theirs, it is believed that several were killed and wounded. The Herald of Freedom and Torchlight, September 18, 1861. Major J. Parker Gould of the 13th Massachusetts in Sharpsburg wrote, There was a skirmish yesterday at Shepherdstown between the rebels and our troops. A canal boat was passing at the time, and one bowman was mortally wounded. The Confederates seem to know our weakness in numbers and are becoming saucy. Uh, there was a serious a flood in November that put the canal commission, but in December, um, the canal boats began to move again toward Cumberland. Reports were coming in that 87 boats had cleared Cumberland and carried 7,613 tons of coal, 633 tons of lumber, cordwood, cooperage, 80 tons of hay and oats, all heading to Harper's Ferry and Sandy Hook, where at least half of that overall load would be loaded on eastbound Baltimore and Ohio cars, and those emptied cars would be heading back up to Cumberland imminently. Stonewall Jackson, by this time his name is Stonewall here, and that nickname at, at first Manassas, first bull run. By this time, uh, Jackson noticed he was his headquarters was in Winchester, he uh, sent a number of expeditions, his expeditions to the north to disable Dan number five and one to disable Dan number four. While the destruction of both dams was important to the Confederates, Dam number five was Jackson's first choice. Why? Both dams were built log cribbed and rock filled in the 1830s. Dam number four's leakiness had been fixed with new masonry by the spring of 1861. But dam number five was not only still leaking and prone to sabotage, but it was just that much further up the river away from Federal General Banks' men further east in Frederick, Maryland. The first one was in the first week of December against dam number five, led by Turner Ashby. Uh, it was a failure. All of them were a failure. Uh, the Union troops were strongly posted, and of course they had the icy Potomac River between them. Working conditions were difficult. The Confederates tried to divert water around the Virginia end of the dam. Uh, they also tried to cut the wooden cribbing of the dam on the Virginia side, but the, the strongly entrenched or strongly posted Union sharpshooters prevented them from inflicting any damage. Saturday through Sunday, December 7th through 8th, Federal Colonel Samuel Leonard turns the tables. Confederate Major Elisha Franklin Paxton of the 27th Virginia, who arrived at Dam No. 5 on the Virginia side near dusk that Saturday, December 7th, seemed to have his work of dam destruction well under control. With arms of fire for cover, for five hours his men worked at destroying the dam in the ice-cold water. Colonel Samuel Leonard of the 13th Massachusetts saw that his men, armed with short-range smooth bores at Dam Number 5, couldn't withstand the onslaught from Confederate Rockbridge Artillery Captain William McLaughlin's six-gun battery and the fire of 600 better-armed regulars firing from the Virginia side. So, Colonel Leonard gave new orders. Using the night time to change things, he replaced the company with another company from Williamsport that had much better Enfield rifled muskets. Leonard switched two companies, sending the C Company with shorter range smoothbore rifles from Dam No. 5 to No. 4, and replacing them with Company G at the besieged Dam No. 5. William McLaughlin's Rockbridge Artillery began early the next morning, Sunday, December 8th. This time, firing boldly right from the brink of the river. But they became surprised to face a barrage of fire that was much more lethal than the day before. They were driven back, and after dark, they snuck back to retrieve their pieces. Confederate Paxton, supervising the assault, wrote later, 
At daybreak Sunday morning, our cannon opened fire upon them again, but they were so sheltered in the canal, from which in the meantime they had drawn off the water, that it was found impossible to dislodge them. As my workmen could not be protected against the enemy's fire, I found it necessary to abandon the enterprise. Charles E. Davis of the 13th Massachusetts remembered the vast difference between the Enfield rifled muskets and the smooth bores. Prior to our arrival, this part of the river was protected by troops supplied with the old smooth bore musket of a very antiquated pattern, with too little power to carry a bullet across the river, so that they were a constant source of ridicule by the enemy, who were much better armed, and who amused themselves by coming down to the river daily and placing the thumb of the right hand to the nose and the thumb of the left hand to the little finger of the right hand would make rapid motions with the fingers to the great exasperation of the Union men who were powerless to prevent it. After we were placed there with our Enfield rifles, there was a less time spent in arranging their fingers and more in the use of their feet. <laughs> Late that Sunday, December 8th, Harry Gilmore and his friend Welch tried to recover Confederate pieces near the shore. The enemy were all concealed behind their rip-rap walls of the canal and impossible to shell them out. Our men were prevented from limbering and carrying off our pieces by a very hot fire of musketry from the enemy on the other bank, and when two or three men had been wounded, Colonel Ashby rode up and told Captain McLaughlin that the guns must be brought away and also the horses of lieutenant and sergeant tied near them. But not a man of the battery would volunteer to go after them. I proposed to Welch that we should procure the horses. He agreed, and without saying a word to anyone, we tied our horses behind the cliff and crawled within 200 yards of the horses and guns when the enemy opened on us a brisk fire from the canal. Without stopping, we made a dash for the horses, and never probably before were halters unloosed in so short a time. This done, we leaped on them and fled, lying flat on their necks. The leaden hail was all around us, but we soon got out of range, and vaulting on our own, we led the recovered horses back, very much to the amusement of the colonel and the chagrin of the lieutenant and sergeant when we said, Gentlemen, here are your horses. Don't get them into such a tight place again. Welch and I then offered to take our company and bring off the guns, but Captain McLaughlin would not consent, bringing them away himself after night. Soon after Welch and I had recovered the horses, I was lying down in a field under cover of a knoll, my horse browsing in the bottom, when Colonel Ash became and informed me that Captain Moore of the 2nd Virginia Infantry was in a very precarious position in a large mill and he wished me to take a message to him, which must be done on foot. I took the message and started on this dangerous mission, being obliged for 500 yards to cross in full view of the enemy on the other side of the river. Of course, I was in a great hurry to accomplish my task, and as soon as I got within range of their muskets, I started at full speed across the flat, balls flying around and cutting up the sod in a lively manner. Three or four times I halted and found refuge behind piles of friendly rocks or trees to take breath. At last I reached the mill in safety and delivered the message. I returned in greater fear than ever lest I might receive a wound in the back, a soldier's dread. But I reported all safe to Colonel Ashby and was fully repaid by his kind thanks and complimentary speeches. The storm that night was terrific, and the men suffered awfully from cold. One of our officers had a flag and a whiskey, and under the pressing necessities of the case, I stole it from his ambulance and divided it among the field officers. Next morning, the officer was in a towering rage about it. A Confederate team crept down to the dam, gathered at its southern abutment, with the idea of digging a ditch around the southern end of the dam, so... The flowing water would undermine the dam, causing it to collapse. The dam didn't collapse because the water level dropped quickly after their work, reducing the diverted stream to a trickle. During the second attempt 
It was actually day number four, again led by Ashby during the second week of December. It was a failure as well. Wednesday, December 11th, 1861, Dam Number 4, north of Shepherdstown, Virginia. Turner Ashby's dam digging doesn't work. Initially, they were spied opposite. The Confederates were spied opposite to Dam Number 4. They disappeared. The 12th Indiana, who was on duty there at Dam Number 4, sent a party of men across to see if the Confederates had indeed left. They were captured. That's the most significant thing that occurred there. That precipitated a sharp exchange, but no damage was done to the canal. The third attempt was the one uh, that Jackson attended in person. It was during the uh, third week of December for about five days. The Confederates were opposite, arrayed between Harper's Ferry, or I'm sorry, from Falling Waters to Little Georgetown. They made threats and demonstrations as if they were going to cross the river at uh, Falling Waters, where the main intention was to try to breach Dan Number 5. Tuesday, December 17th, Confederate Captain Raleigh T. Colson of Berkeley County led a team onto Dam Number 5 after dark and through the night hacked away at the log cribbing in the middle of the dam. The rubble held by the log cribs was piled up on the dam so that by morning of the 18th, the piled rubble atop the still-standing dam was a breastworks, shielding them from Federal's gunfire. At daybreak, the Federals discovered the breastworks. Massachusetts soldiers went downriver and found a location from which they could bring fire upon the workers and soon drove the Southerners from the dam and into the mill house. For cover, Charlestown-born artillerist Roger Preston Chu's two artillery pieces had been shelling a brick house on the Maryland side where the shooting was coming from. But on December 19th, Wednesday, Battery E of the 1st Pennsylvania Artillery answered with two 10-pound parrots, forcing Chu to take cover 50 yards to their right. Lieutenant William Thomas Pogue of the Confederate Rockbridge Artillery remembered seeing Chu and others shrunk behind a large tree with shells flying by to the left and to the right. Finally, the last day, I think it was December 20th, the last day of the expedition, uh, Jackson, in the words of one of his officers, yankied the Yankees, meaning that he tricked them. He had boats made to potentially cross the river in a full view of the Union troops at Dan Number 5. He sent them upriver toward Little Georgetown. The Union troops were sure that he was going to cross there. Threats had been made the previous day. So they all followed, apparently left the work party with an evening to work on the dam uh, without being fired upon. They heard timber breaking, assumed the dam had been breached, and left. The very next day, the Union General uh, Banks reports that canal boats are still traveling in both directions. Jackson was sent one more small expedition back to dam number five. They spent two nights at the dam. January 1st and January 2nd, and one of their uh, men in charge there wrote that they spent two additional nights widening the breach.